Uh, we're looking at the law of God. Now, we're going to, we're actually getting close to wrapping up the, the faith statement. We're going to pause it the next time I teach. Uh, we're not having Sunday school next week, right? Uh, according to Pastor Doug now. That could change. Crystal said that he's not always right. But <laughs> that's what he said. Or that's what she said. It's what Crystal There wasn't an email sent out. There wasn't an email. Has that changed? Have you heard anything? I don't know. I, I have no idea. I don't know. Nobody knows. Mm-hmm. All right. Forget I said that. We'll, uh, we'll just pretend like we're going to until we're a little differently. However, we are going to pause with the face statement uh, for the next little bit. And... Uh, Whenever I pick back up on my teaching again, we'll, we're going to look at the, the study. We're going to study a little short segment of the Reformation uh, to show us how we got here, right? Does that make sense? And we'll just we'll stay over the Reformation, then we'll, we'll make our way through the, the, the councils of Dort, and we'll look at the remonstrance and all kinds of stuff. All right? That sound good. All right, Miss Lee, uh, do you, okay. we're good? All right, so we're looking at point three. Um, we can read points one and two again if you want, but we're going to concentrate on points, points three through seven and uh, look at the law of God. Now, I just want to preface this. There's, we've had people in the past, um, even since I've been here, they they come in, and I remember this one lady in particular. Um, I don't remember her name or anything, but... She seemed to be very zealous for the Bible and all that kind of stuff. And I really liked her personality. She always complimented my teaching and preaching and things like that. But she was of the persuasion that uh, we had to abide by the law uh, and things like that. And, and again, we uh, we kind of, Pastor Allen kind of nipped that in the butt and, and was like, no, that's, that's not who we are. We're not going to. You know, they always come in thinking we're going to change everything for them, and uh, like they've got some great idea. But uh, and it's usually it usually involves uh, adhering to a dietary law, or or maybe uh, meeting on Saturday or something like that, or or honoring some uh, um, festival or or, or or ceremony that's spelled out in the Old Testament or something like that, and they always, uh, they just, they, they, they're, they're there. You know, people are always talking about it. You hear the critics that would uh, say things uh, in reference to uh, uh, just the, the law and the ceremonies that were meant for Israel, and, you know, sometimes they can stump a Baptist who is not studied, right? Is not uh, very well studied. So uh, we're going to look at this. We're going to address these things and uh, just try to pick them apart and show you why we believe the things that we believe and why we do the things that we do. So uh, again, we'll look at one and two. We'll, we'll read them and then we'll come back to point three and and uh, concentrate on it. Uh, so the law of God, point nineteen one. God gave Adam a law of comprehensive obedience written in his heart and a specific precept not to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And by these, God obligated him and all his descendants to a personal, total, exact, and perpetual obedience. Adam gave power and ability to keep it, or uh, obedience. God promised if Adam fulfilled it and threatened death if he broke it and gave Adam the power and ability to keep it. <clears throat> Point two. The same law that was first written in the human heart continued to be a perfect rule of righteousness after after the fall. It was delivered by God on Mount Sinai in the Ten Commandments and was written in two tables. The first four commandments contain our duty to God and the other six contain our duty to humanity. Uh, This is why the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself, right? All the law is wrapped up in those two commandments, right? Uh, In addition to this law, usually called the moral law, 
That's an important term right there. In addition to this law, usually called the moral law, God was pleased to give the people of Israel ceremonial laws containing several topological ordinances. In some ways, these concern worship by prefiguring Christ, his graces, actions, sufferings, and benefits. In other ways, they revealed various instructions about moral duties. Since all of these ceremonial laws were appointed only until the new order arrived, they are now abolished and taken away by Christ, by Jesus Christ. As the true Messiah and the only lawgiver, he was empowered by the Father to do this. Point four. To Israel, he also gave various judicial laws, which ceased at the same time their nation ended. These laws no longer obligate anyone as part of that institution only the general principles of justice continue to have moral value. Again, that's important that we understand that. Point five, the moral law forever requires obedience of everyone, both those who are justified as well as others. This obligation arises not only because of its content, but also because of the authority of God the Creator who gave it. Nor does Christ in any way dissolve this obligation in the gospel. Instead, he greatly strengthens it. Point six. True believers are not under the law as a covenant of works to be justified or condemned by it, yet it is very useful to them and to others as a rule of life that informs them of the will of God and their duty. It directs and obligates them to live according to its precepts. <clears throat> it also exposes the sinful corruptions of their nature, hearts, and lives. As they examine themselves in the light of the law, they come to further conviction of, illumination for, and hatred of sin, along with a clear view of their need for Christ and the perfection of his obedience. The law is also useful to the regenerate to restrain their corruptions because it forbids sin. The punishment threatened by the law shows them what even their sins deserve and what troubles they may expect in this life due to their sin even though they are freed from the curse and undiminished severity of approval, of obedience, and the blessings they may expect when they keep it, even though these blessings are not owed to them by the law as a covenant of works. If people do good and refrain from evil because the law encourages good and, and discourages evil, that does not indicate that they are under the law and not under grace. Point seven, these uses of the law are not contrary to the grace of the gospel, but are in sweet harmony with it. For the spirit of Christ subdues and enables the human will to do freely and cheerfully what the will of God, as revealed in the law, requires. All right. So, just a preface before we dive into it. There are some categories concerning the law. And one of those is the moral law, which the moral law, all of us are supposed to obey, correct? Right. No, uh, it's never been a good idea to steal or commit murder or any of the uh, uh, moral uh, laws. Uh, they are all supposed to be always obeyed by all people, Okay. Now, there are other laws that are only pertain to Israel. For example, the judiciary laws. Uh, that is Israel's laws concerning how the nation is to do business, right? It's a theocracy, Israel was supposed to be, right? All right, so we're not obligated to be under, under rule uh, by the judicial laws of Israel. Uh, whatever Israel was judicially commanded to, to, to do as a nation, we are not, uh, that does not uh, have any bearings over us. Uh, you get your ceremonial laws, that is the, you know, the, the Feast of Tabernacles, if you will, the Passover, all those things. Uh, we are not commanded to do those things. And, you know, if we do them, it is not something that we do uh, as a command. It is to celebrate Christ and what he has done for us. And of course, uh, you've got your dietary laws as well that are in there. That's probably, or that's part of the judicial law. But uh, we don't have, we can eat pork, right? We're not commanded not to eat pork. 
Okay, that is for Israel. That makes sense? All right, now we're going to prove these things from the Scriptures. Uh, hopefully you brought your Bibles. Because we'll uh, run out of paper if we try to print everything. Our entire chapters that this uh, this wants us to look at. But we'll take your Bible and turn to Hebrews 9. says, in addition to this law, usually called the moral law, alright, that was the Ten Commandments, right? There's other other points in, in, in the law peppered throughout the scriptures that, that, that uh, give us a moral direction, uh, but it's tied to the commandments. Uh, so in addition to the moral law, God was pleased to give the people of Israel, again, it's important that you understand that phrase, right? The people of Israel, ceremonial laws. Um, many times, the cults, whether it be Jehovah's Witnesses or Seventh-day Adventists, or, uh, well, those are the two primary ones, they always, or try to, in some way, celebrate the ceremonial laws. Uh, and and also the judicial laws by by Israel the dietary laws also uh, fall fall into that. Uh, Pastor Allen always makes a a comment when he addresses those those folks that they want to obey they cherry pick it right they they pick what they want uh, so you know there's that time of the month um, for a certain demographic of people that we don't. Put them out of the house for a week, right? You, nobody's advocating for that. Well, that's in the law. Uh, we don't get to cherry pick, right? So um, they they always want to point to doing things uh, like that. And uh, you know, again, Jehovah's Witnesses are bad about it, and so is the Seventh Day Adventists. Uh, the cults are very, very prone to uh, returning to some form of the law. And again, this is what. Paul dealt with, right? When he writes uh, uh, Romans, Galatians, uh, all throughout all of his writings, he is dealing with a certain segment of the uh, the uh, heretical movement within the church known as the Judaizers. Uh, that's what he dealt with. That was the first heresy of the Christian church, right? It was the Judaizers. Paul writes on that. So it has to be addressed, right? In addition to this law, usually called the moral law, God was pleased to give the people of Israel ceremonial laws containing several topological ordinances, meaning they were pictures, right? In some ways, these concerned worship by prefiguring Christ, His graces, actions, sufferings, and benefits. This is why the Bible says that the all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for rebuke, instruction, uh, and doctrine, right? Well, that's why, because the, all those ceremonial laws, they picture Christ, either Christ, His graces, actions, His sufferings, or His benefits. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. You got your Bibles. <clears throat> we'll just read over it um, without getting too deep, but you get the, you'll get the idea. Uh, then indeed... Even the first covenant has ordinances of divine suffering, excuse me, of divine service and earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. You're given a picture of the tabernacle, right? And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, which were the golden pot and the, that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant, talking about the ark, what was in the Ark of the Covenant, and above it were cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot speak in detail. Now, when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. 
But into the second part of the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic. You see that? It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with the food and drinks of various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with, with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer and the sprinkling of the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You see that? Everything that they did uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, specifically the day of Yom Kippur, uh, or Yom Kippur, uh, that day, everything they did as far as the washings and the ceremonies that were associated with the temple was a foreshadowing of Christ. Verse 15, and for, the re for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Let's pause for a second. What's he saying here? He's saying that the high priest, when he would do his duties, right, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, before Christ came, and he would do his duties for the nation of Israel on the day of Yom Kippur, uh, or, you know, Passover, or whatever that might be, when he would sprinkle the blood, and all those things, it was a foreshadowing of what Christ would do. Typically, or really, he had to do it <coughs> once a year, and basically had to, uh, if you... If you had sin or, or anything like that, you had to always sacrifice. It was a continual place of blood and killing because it never done the job, right? It was it was just picturesque of what Christ would do. When Christ walked into the Holy of Holies in the heavenlies with His blood and sprinkled the mercy seat uh, uh, in heaven with His blood for our sins, it was complete, right? There's no need to do the ceremonies anymore. Right? It's been done once and for all. Does that make sense? So, uh, verse 16. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testament. <coughs> for a testament is enforced after men are dead, since it has no power at all, while the testament lives, the state lives. Uh, therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken, every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. And likewise he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things were purified by blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Amen? All right. Verse 23. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of these uh, of the things in heaven uh, should be purified with these, but the, it, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, for Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another, he then would have no would have to would have to would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. But it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered, listen, once to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly wait for him will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Alright? So, 
You understand all that? Look, we're just reading up, but you get you get the point, right? The old was a uh, the old ceremonial laws were pictures of what Christ would do. This is why we don't we're not a part of the Jewish nation. We're not converts to Judaism, where we have to go into the into the temple and and ask a high priest to to uh, say a prayer and sprinkle blood and all that stuff. It's been done by Christ at the Holy of Holies. But that was a picture. Uh, and again, uh, Hebrews 10, 1, for the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. They were inadequate. Not only... Did they have to do them often, but they were just inadequate. They, they were only a picture. Christ has done the actual atoning. He has done what the high priest could not do. He's not doing a ceremony. He's doing the actual act. Amen? Anybody got anything? Any questions? I have an unrelated kind of question. Okay. With those uh, verses um, 25 and then 27 through 28, refute the um, Catholic teaching of transubstantiation? Or are there better verses than that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think Romans 9, just in general, does that because, again, they take it back. So, what she's talking about, uh, I don't know so much about transubstantiation. I mean, I know what it is, mm -hmm. but. She's talking about the mass, what they call the mass, and the reason when they when you incorporate inside of Catholicism uh, the the uh, uh, the Lord's Supper and what they would call it the Eucharist and and all that all that kind of stuff. It, it's it's not a biblical concept what they are performing. Now there there is some biblical stuff that they do, uh, but. Basically, what they say is the Catholic, the reason Jesus is still on the, is a, is on the cross, the crucifix. You know, we wear a cross; they have a crucifix, right? The reason for that is is that they believe that every mass, the priest is re-sacrificing Christ, and that stands against what what we just read, right? He was he had done it once and for all. This is uh, I don't know if you've ever uh, you can watch some YouTube videos if they ever uh, drop the bread. The priest will get down on his hands and knees and get every bit of it up. Uh, I mean, they'll he'll get it all. And the reason for that is they transubstantiation. They believe it's the actual blood and body of Christ, right? And again, they believe that they are re-sacrificing every time they take it, uh, where the priest offers it, right? That's that's for the. I don't know how that got. Uh, I don't know. They didn't have Romans nine on it or Hebrews nine, right? Uh, of course, you have to understand the fall of Rome historically. Uh, there was ignorance, widespread ignorance. They didn't, nobody read anything. As a matter of fact, in the Middle Ages, the furthest most people traveled was seven miles from their home. That was it. Unless they had to go to war or something of that nature, they never left. They never read books. They never did anything. Most people couldn't read. Only the, the very wealthy, only the... the the priests, and not even most of the priests couldn't read. Some of the popes weren't educated. So it just descended into uh, uh, just assumptions and things of that nature, and people went wild with things, and, and uh, that's why there needed to be a Reformation, right? And that's what we'll study next month, or the month after, whenever I get to teach again, right? Uh, Galatians chapter 4. Is that, anybody get, is that, was that good enough? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, Galatians 4. And again, if you're looking at your little sheet of paper, I've got the 3 for point 3, and then the different dots are for the different uh, scripture proofs with each thing. So, Galatians 4, 1 through 3, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. 
again, he's talking about the law. Galatians is probably one of the best uh, texts of Scripture to to combat those that would like to return to uh, some form of the law, whether it be the ceremonial or the dietary laws or something of that nature. Um, Gal- uh, Galatians is it. And that's what he's talking about in Galatians. And we'll quote Galatians several times uh, throughout the study. Uh, uh, the Galatians, you know, they, uh, Paul was pretty ticked at them, right? He says, Who hath bewitched you, you foolish Galatians? Uh, Paul called the entire Galatian church fools. So, you know, he said, You foolish Galatians. Because they had fallen for the Judaizers' lie. And uh, he, right, right there in chapter 4, he's trying to describe to them uh, the, the law and being slave of it and uh, it being a child and we're under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father, which was now, right? Uh, Colossians 2.17 uh, is talking about the law and the ceremonial uh, portions of the law. Uh, that it says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. And again, we'll quote Colossians again here in a moment, and it really does a good job of combating those that would have you to uh, uh, celebrate some type of Sabbath or some type of uh, Jewish holiday or whatever, feast or whatever they would have. Uh, not only that, but uh, uh, your diet and things of that nature. You know, There's a lot of people that would, uh, would tell you that the Bible still wants you to not eat pork or catfish or something like that. Uh, well, that is, those laws were for Israel, right, as a nation, and not the Christian church. Okay? But again, we're talking primarily here about the ceremonial laws. Uh, that, that, that's dietary. Uh, so, go to the next one. If you, uh, again, bounce back over here to your Faith statement and point three, we start the new sentence after that first series of, of scripture references. It says, in other ways, they revealed various instruction about moral duties. Okay, moral duties. First Corinthians five, verse seven. It says, therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Again, where the ceremonial laws point to Christ, we are always obligated to keep the moral laws. Morality never changes when it comes to God, right? It's always been wrong for sexual immorality. It's always been wrong for, for uh, you know, any type of, uh, of moral sin. And we're always to purge that out. Okay? 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive it. Again, the moral laws are something we always adhere to. We always submit to. There's never a time when it's okay to be immoral. Jude 23, but others say with fear, pulling them out of fire, hating the garment, hating, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Again, we're talking about moral laws in that sentence. Any any problem there? You understand what we're talking about, right? difference between the ceremonial laws and the moral laws. And it is clear from Scripture uh, what those are. Alright? Go to the next sentence on the faith statement. Since all these ceremonial laws were appointed only until the new order arrived, does anybody have a hard time understanding what the new order is? That's the New Testament, right? Alright? We are living in that new order now. They are now abolished and taken away by Jesus Christ as the true Messiah and only lawgiver. He was empowered by the Father to do this. 
Colossians uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 17, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So listen to what he says. Here's the one I was telling you about Colossians. So let no one judge you in food or in drink. It's okay for us to eat catfish, right? Papa said amen, right? Uh, food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. He's talking about the Jewish laws. Again, some people will say, well, they had Jewish festival or excuse me they had festivals and new moons and sabbaths in pagan religions that's not the problem there's a thing called context that we that we have to to stay with right he, paul's not talking about that paul has no problems right now with the pagans and their festivities and their festivals and and you know sacrificing to diana or something like that he, he does address some of those things for example, in 1 Timothy, when he tells the women not to adorn themselves with pearls and, and gold and braided hair, he's talking about the temple prostitutes that was cursed, uh, uh, that tempted the Ephesians. Okay? In Colossians, he's talking about the Judaizers. It's clear what he's talking about. He's talking about those Jewish dietary ceremonial laws. That they are, that they are, that these Judaizers have come in and tried to make them institute. Uh, because the Judaizers, don't forget, the Judaizers said you have to become a Jew before you can become a Christian. That was their whole thing. So this is what they were talking about. They were a shadow, and in verse 17 clears up whether it was paganism or if it was the Jew Jewish feasts, right? It says, which are a shadow of things to come. The pagan festivities and holidays and things like that weren't a shadow of things to come, right? They were demonic. Only the Jewish festivals, new moons and Sabbath, were a shadow of things to come. But the substance is of Christ. Christ has abolished those dietary, those ceremonial laws that were a picture of what is to come. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any problems with that? Do you know any friends that are messed up in that stuff? I have a question about it. So yeah, I do have some friends who like they they don't do like the dietary things like, yep. anymore. But mm -hmm. they're still like like really hung up on like the Sabbath. It's like is it something that should be like oh it's you know, it doesn't matter if you do or don't, or is it more like something I should be like, hey, I mean, don't do that because you're you know, you're focused on the shadow and not the actual... So what denomination are they part of? Uh, there's like Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh-day Seventh Adventists. Uh, well, they also do... Seventh-day Adventists, yes, they... they. If, if the Sabbath was their only deal, then you could work with that. Um, but Christ is our Sabbath. Uh, he is our rest. And that doesn't mean that we don't need one in seven to rest. But... We don't give a day, just one day, to, to devote to Christ or to God. It's every day, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that's part of what being a Christian is. You die to self daily. Uh, however, um, for the Seventh-day Adventists, they've got a whole other body. They, they also do some dietary stuff, but, but they cherry-pick. They, they cherry-pick what they want. But none of, like, like Pastor Allen says, none of them is kicking their wives out during their once-a-month thing. Right? None of them's doing that. Um, that that's so they, they cherry pick what they want, and and you know it's just if that doesn't scream contradiction, I don't know what else can. All right, uh, we have the moral laws and the Bible's clear uh, on that that we have to ad adhere to the moral laws. But as far as the Sabbaths, the new moon, the festivals, Colossians right there, right? Mm -hmm. That's how he was combating. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. But there, there's a whole lot more going on there than just, they, they just meet on the Sabbath. There's a whole lot more going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, and matter of fact, I tell people this when 
Uh, we talk about uh, the Masonic Lodge or something of that nature. Um, it's the same same principle applies with uh, with Seventh Day Adventists. In every conservative biblical biblically sound seminary or Bible college, those two are always, without question, are always thrown into the cults class. Okay, so when you study cults, whether it be Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormonism or you know whatever it might be, modalism, whatever. Masonic Lodge and the, uh, uh, the Seventh-day Adventists are always in there. And they're in there for a reason. It's not just that all the conservatives got it wrong, right? Yeah. All the biblically sound, doctrinally sound Bible teachers and things, not all of them got it wrong for a reason. All right? That's it's because it is a cult. That makes sense? All right. So, again, this is what we believe. This is what, so, folks, and, and again, this is why we study these things, right? This is why we study the, the faith statements. It, it's not because we hold the faith statements in some uh, unbiblical, uh, you know, upon some unbiblical high level. The faith statements are there because the battles have already been fought. Okay? That's why we wrote them. And we've lost that. By and large, most Christian denominations have lost their heritage, Right? We have no understanding of when. So whenever these Seventh Day Adventists come in or uh, Jehovah's Witnesses come in, we don't know how to fight them. Most Baptists will have the, the, a Jehovah's Witness will wipe the floor with them because they do not understand Bible and they do not understand the history, church history in any sense of the imagination, or uh, they, they just they just don't know. It. Uh, and, and the battles have already been fought. We already have it. We already know how to defeat Arianism. So Jehovah's Witnesses don't have a prayer. We've already had Athanasius come before us. He's already took the scriptures and, and done away with Arius. Right? Pelagius comes along. We have Augustine. We have Martin Luther. We have all of them. We don't have to worry. Jeho the the Seventh-day Adventists come along. The Judaizers. We've already fought that battle. Right? We've got it on paper. That's why we read these things, right? That's why we study these. That makes sense. We don't have to fall victim to them anymore. Because if we study, we, we're already prepared for it. We already can catechize our children, right? All right, so that was, that was free. <laughs> but we're not going to make it to, I don't even think we're going to make it to point four. All right, <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2. 15 through 16, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so as to create himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. All right, again, ceremonial laws. Again, Ephesians is another one of those books that Paul writes. And in it, he is, he is addressing the Judaizer, the heresy that is the Judaizers. And uh, we've become one. The Old Testament saint, the New Testament saint are now one. And it's been reconciled by Christ into one body. And those ceremonial laws, those dietary laws and judicial laws have been abolished. Right? We're good? Now, point four. We'll, just, we'll do this point and then we'll come back to the rest. <clears throat> point four. To Israel, he also gave judicial laws. Alright, so point three was over ceremonial laws. Now we look at judicial laws, which ceased at the time of their nation ended. These laws no longer obligate anyone as a part of that institution. Only their general principles of justice continue to have moral value. And again, that little caveat there, only their general principles of justice continue to have moral value. Uh, again, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for rebuke, for instruction in righteousness, uh, for doctrine, 
we still can use the principles of those laws for justice. And again, the ceremonial laws, it's a picture of Christ. We still study the Old Testament. We still uh, uh, love it. Uh, one of our, uh, one of the, uh, one of the arguments from the Church of Christ is they say sometimes that that's the Old Testament. It doesn't count, and that's uh, that's not necessarily true. There is value in the Old Testament. Uh, it's we again. The judicial laws and things, the letter of the law we don't uh, adhere to, uh, we don't have to submit to uh, as a nation of Israel or, or its ceremonial laws, but there are, there is value in those. And one of them is uh, reaping the principles of justice. All right, so Exodus 21, uh, you can go there in your Bible. I'm going to be closer to the front. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. They want us to read the entire chapter. So we will. Maybe. But we get the point, right? Uh, Chapter 21 of Exodus. Now these are the judgments which you, you shall set before them. If you buy a servant, if you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years, and the seventh he shall go out and free, pay nothing. Right? If he comes in by himself, he should go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife, and she has borne sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. <clears throat> but... If the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door and the doorpost, and his master shall uh, pierce his ear with an an awl, and he shall serve him forever. And again, this uh, may seem crude and evil to the world, but uh, slavery was a necessity in those days. because it was, you know, merciful. Um, that he didn't just take this guy as a slave illegally. This guy came to him uh, because he was poor and, and those things, and, and, and this rich fellow has taken care of him. Uh, the principles of justice, for example, in that, are that we are to deal uh, with our brothers and our sisters uh, in, in Christ, believers, we're supposed to deal with them mercifully, right? Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, let, let's just keep reading. And if a man sells his daughter to a female slave, and she shall not go out as a male slave, as the male slave do, if she does not please her master, who has betrothed her to himself, and she then then he shall uh, let her be redeemed. He shall also have no right to sell her to a foreign people, since he has dealt deceitfully with her. And if he has uh, betrothed her to his son, he shall deal with her according to the custom of of daughters. If he takes another wife, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, and her her marriage rights. If he does not uh, do these three for her, then she shall go out free without paying money. Uh, the law concerning violence. He who strikes a man so that he uh, that so that he dies shall surely be put to death. Uh, however, if he did not lie and wait, but God delivered him into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place where he may flee. Um, he's talking about the sanctuary city. Um, but if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbor to kill him by treachery, you shall take him um, from my altar that he may die. And again, this is one thing about Exodus here that that uh, most people, you know, they'll always quote eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, and things of that nature. Um, but it's talking about the nation itself is to do this, uh, not individuals with uh, 
vigilanteism or something of that nature, right? Vigilante is forbidden uh, by the scriptures. It's the nation that does this. So the principle here is, is that we can take as a nation and advocate for laws that promote the same justice, right? Uh, if a man killed, premeditates and kills another man, then he should, he should be killed, right? Uh, that's Genesis also says the same thing. Uh, that is the principle of it, right? Now, uh, again, but that's, again, we're pulling <coughs> only from the principles. Uh, we can uh, look at Exodus. You can go and read Exodus 21 and 22 uh, for this. We're uh, running out of time, but uh, again, this is uh, uh, just the principle of these laws that are that are taken in the principles of justice. Uh, again, we're not obligated. Again, in point four says to Israel, he uh, also gave various judicial laws, which ceased at the time of their nation ended. These no longer, laws no longer obligate anyone as a part of that institution. Only the general principles of justice continue to have moral value. Uh, and again, we don't have to do everything uh, as a nation that is uh, that corresponds to what Israel had to do. But we do, we should uh, take that general principle of of justice and apply it to our to our laws, right? Uh, Genesis 49.10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor lawgiver between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and uh, to him uh, shall be the obedience of the people. Again, Shiloh, again, is a picture of Christ. He has come. So the, uh, the scepter is really still not departing from Judah because Christ is a of the line of the uh, tribe of Judah. Uh, and he's always there, but Israel itself has, uh, has been uh, eliminated, if you will, for, 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 for the time being. Uh, the, the nation that is, calls itself Israel today is not, not the same uh, yet. It may serve as an infrastructure for the coming of Christ at the, at the end, but as of right now, uh, it, it's, it's not a part of God's plan as, as far as redemption. First Peter chapter 2, 13 through 14 says, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the sake, whether it's the king supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for punishment of evildoers for the praise of those who do good. That First Peter chapter 2 is just, uh, uh, verse 13, 14 is just our command to submit to the government, uh, whatever government we're in. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, he, uh, Christ says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So again, there is moral value in the law. It's not destroyed. It's just been fulfilled. There's general principles of justice, mercy, morality, all those things uh, we adhere to. Does that make sense? Matthew chapter 5, 38 through 39 You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him also the other. First Corinthians chapter 9. Eight through ten. This will be it. Do I say these things as a mere man? Or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it the oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it all together for our sakes? Again, this is the, uh, contextually, this is talking about how pastors should be paid uh, for their work. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. But again, he's, they're, they're giving you examples of how the 
the law of God has moral value. It has ceremonial, or the ceremonial law, also, again, doctrinal value, and all those things. We don't necessarily adhere to them, uh, to the letter, but uh, we have uh, moral value in them. I'm just going to mark this real quick. We have moral value there. We have uh, uh, doctrinal principles that we can glean from from the scriptures, or from the uh, from the Old Testament, uh, as it pertains to Christ. And a lot of times it's spelled out for us, right? Uh, we read through Hebrews and, and all those things, and those what the, it tells us what that particular ceremony was represents. Amen. Any questions? So we should no longer have any problems with the Seventh-day Adventists or the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? We're good on that? All right, so the Judaizers has already been fought. Paul's already fought it. He's already won the fight. And we've already got faith statements that uh, summarize our victories, right? All right, let's pray. Father, again, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for everything that you've given us. Uh, we pray that uh, we would, our faith would be strengthened because of the faith statements um, combined with your word, uh, or should I say your word combined with the faith statements, uh, with church history and all the false teachers that have come, come and have been defeated by your word, Lord. We, we thank you for that. And we pray, Father, that for each of us, we would, uh, we would, uh, we wouldn't be hoodwinked by those by those false teachers. Lord, we love you and we thank you so much again for your, everything that you've given us. Uh, 2,000 years of Christian history. Uh, 2,000 years of preaching and teaching and developing doctrines um, based on your word. Lord, we thank you so much for it. Uh, help us to learn. In Christ's name, amen.